But tonight we have Arizona Dairy, keeping cool in the desert. Dr. Duarte Diaz is an associate professor in animal and comparative biomedical science, which is same as my school in, on campus. And he's also the dairy, state dairy extension specialist. So you guys know the rules. All you guys are muted with no camera since it's a learning experience. You can use the Q&A if you have questions regarding the presentation. If you wanna answer something, if Duarte asks you something or we ask you, do that in the chat. And of course, questions will be addressed at the appropriate time. Please be polite and respectful. We will have the recording available later. And of course, no harassing or you go bye-bye. <laughs> so this next slide changed, guys. Ready? Because if you look down here, guess what we got in today? The shirts are in and they will be going out either maybe early next week for those that have attended the five live webinars. So a lot of you, I know Josephine's been on here, but uh, if you've got the questionnaire and filled that out and gave us a size, you should be seeing that in the next week or so, depending on the mail. So with that, I will stop my share and I will introduce Dr. Duarte Diaz. He's been a friend and colleague of mine since I got here in Arizona. And he's, go ahead and share your screen there, sir. And he's got uh, cows in go. his background. Live without cows. <laughs> All right, so I will turn it over to you and I'll sit back and enjoy. We'll see you. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, everybody else, for the and the opportunity to chat with you guys this afternoon. Um, I'm going to try to keep it uh, fairly informal, hopefully very um, fun and educational. Uh, my primary objective today is to give you guys a little bit of perspective about the dairy industry. Why is it is dairy industry is such an important uh, industry in Arizona? typically because most people think that it's kind of unusual that we have a um, significant um, dairy industry in the state of Arizona because of our climate, because of the lack of rainfall, desert environment. So I'd like to start uh, these presentations uh, talking a little bit about, in general terms, about the industry. Let me see if I can change the slide, okay? And um, again, if this was a live presentation, we have a little bit of conversation about um of the participants here drink milk well hang um, on I, hang on we can get them to answer in the chat there okay Marty. so first thing do you drink milk yes or no you drink Let's milk see yes chat. or no yeah Let's see, some see the, stuff chat, in the but chat you got to monitor for me yep okay we got a definite yes all cats Good. yes uh-oh josephine does not okay, okay how about do you eat cheese Whole milk only. Yeah, that's right. That's I got whole milk right in my <laughs> right next to me. That it's got some coffee in it. <laughs> very good. Lots of cheese. And how about ice cream? Absolutely. So I, I think the, the the general consensus here is that the products produced by milk, dairy cow, cattle milk. Uh, are, are fairly rich, right? Uh, and again, you know, you have a certain percentage of the population that is avid milkers. You also have percentage of the population that maybe not like the taste of milk, and that are uh, particularly intolerant or or feel in an upset stomach, right? Again, most of that is because of the uh, lower quantities of an enzyme that found that um, lactose. People that have low concentrations of them struggle a little bit drinking dairy products. But again, if you have a lactose intolerance, you eat cheese, primarily the dry cheese, because them is removed uh, in the process. There's other uh, products that are lactose, but now in the market, you can buy lactose reduced or lactose free milk. But in general, most, most of the population um, enjoys ice cream. Ice cream usually hits really on, on any survey that we do. Uh, with, with general consumer lactose intolerance, people treat themselves to ice cream because it's, it's such a delicious product. Uh, 
But again, in the general terms, uh, what I wanted you guys to, to start thinking about is the diversity of products that come from from the dairy industry. And again, this is this is really broad. I mean, we are talking about things like yogurt, um, you know, and different types of, of lactose based uh, products, you know, whey protein that some athletes may use to before they go to the gym or after they go to the gym. Um, you know, there, there's a ton of different things, you know, our creams, our creams, our, 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 our you know, um, all the diversity of the cheeses and yogurts and uh, and products that we see at the supermarket. So again, this is a very lively industry that has done a really good job of ge uh, uh, generating a lot of different products from uh, from the original product that is produced by dairy cows, which is that milk. Um, but the other this is that not that people understand that the dairy industry is much more than just the production of milk. Um, the actual cattle utilizing dairy industries have uh, what we would call a dual purpose, right? We will use them as dairy producing uh, animals into their life cycle or their production cycle is over. And after that, those animals will be used um, like another type of cattle. You know, there will be, there will be milk, meat production or meat generated from the harvest of that. Animal. But that harvest is also important to a lot of things that we um, use on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, there's not a lot of things that we use uh, on the brain because there are some restrictions on what can be used. But you know, for some anti-aging creams and that that are not uh, consumed, that they, they, they're used. The both are used for you know uh, charcoal and fertilizers and different types of processing. Uh, skin, obviously, um, you know, you a lot of the you know baseball gloves are are, are made out of uh, of you know hides, you know, and and. Um, hairs can be used for brushes and filters and all types of uh, textiles. Um, you know, blood is used for a lot of different processings and dyes and inks and minerals and medicine, uh, evilizing agents and, uh, and and other materials. Obviously, the hooves, horns, you know, we've at times given our, our animals treats that are based out of that. But plant foods and pet food and shampoo and conditioner are also utilized utilize some, some products that come from animal hooves, you know, uh, the interpreters are also used, um, you know, in, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, high end instruments use, you know, um, internal organ based strings, uh, tennis racket strings, the, the hormones and enzymes, vitamins and other uh, medical materials, um, even milk itself that is not used for consumption is used for, for plastics, medics and, and other things. Um, and the largest category that we use from from the end product of this industry is is fat. You know, most people don't don't know that you know chewing gum and and other um, uh, consumer things that we have on a regular basis come from from cow fat, uh, but also things like crayons and cosmetics and sticks and and they're utilized in the cement industry and. And you know, and fireworks and, and other other um, industries. So we make a lot of use of this animal uh, through its life cycle. And again, we provide us with food, but at this terminal uh, uh, production cycle, we also use the animal for a lot of different things. And most people are not inherently aware of of how much we use um, the products that are from a dairy cow. The yeah, dairy industry itself is is pretty broad too. I mean, it's 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 consistent of a lot of things that people know, but then there's a lot of components that most people don't uh, or 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 are not keenly aware. Um, the industry is what we see as a dairy producers, right? Those people that are on the farm with the cattle producing the milk. But there's also components are uh, co-ops or co cooperatives, uh, which are groups of dairy producers are joining together so that they can be better at the business of the, of the dairy production. They can buy in bulk. They can do things like that. Uh, but then when the milk is harvested, the rear is produced, that milk usually goes to plants and processors and manufacturers that take that milk and the milk that we consume or all the other products that we talked about. Uh, and those are typically a separate component of the industries. Um, and and the, they're, they're processing the milk and manufacturing all the products. And then on the other side, there are the entities that actually sell that to the consumer, right? So that's the third leg of that uh, complex cycle. Um, <clears throat> again, you typically go to a supermarket and buy the milk of that specific 
specific supermarket chain. Well, that supermarket normally does not have a dairy operation, not producing that milk. They're buying it from a cup or from a, a milking a milk plant or uh, and they're custom labeling it in the logo of that supermarket um, so that you consume. Because milk is a perishable item, a lot of milk that we consume comes from lo locally, right? This is a very close uh, uh, proximity to the end user. The dairy industry ranks fourth behind meat animals, feed crops, and poultry and eggs as the most um, important agriculture industry in the, um, in, in the United States. Um, and in Arizona, that is actually very different because dairy is actually probably the most important agricultural uh, industry in the state. If you look at this table from, I can't remember, 12, uh, it shows that the only industry that produces more uh, cash receipts than the industry is what we call vegetable, melons, potatoes, and sweet potatoes. So instead of being just one industry, these are a lot of different industries all combined together to become the vegetable industry. But so look at that, their their actually sale numbers are very close to the industry. We also have to consider that a lot of the cattle in the state and a lot of the calves produced in the state are also part of this dairy production cycle. So um, those those cattle are not accounted in the dairy operation. When we talk about a dairy operation, somebody tells you, oh my farm has 500 cows. Typically, what they're telling us is that they have 500 milk cows milking at any time of the year. Um, it usually doesn't count the other 50 plus percent that they would have in that operation. So, cow operation has probably a total of 750 cows uh, because there are cows that are repl the replacements and our cows that are growing up through that system to become the next cows in the next cycle. So if you keep on going through there, um, you also see that other crops and hay are very important. The primary uh, crop produced in the state um, is alfalfa currently. So most of that, a big chunk of that alfalfa produced locally is utilized by the dairy industry. Same for corn. Corn is actually harvested for corn silage in a lot of parts of the state, and that is being utilized for, for the dairy industry. So if you can these industries here, these, these three industries, um, you can probably uh, come to the conclusion that dairy uh, is, a, is a very important industry in the state, but also probably the, the, the most important as far as uh, the amount of money it generates. Um, milk is produced and processed and manufactured in every state, uh, but over half of the total production of milk comes from what we call the big dairy states, right? Is California being number one, Wisconsin, New York, and Minnesota round them out. Uh, the other Western uh, state that typically in this conversation is Idaho, which is always in the top five also. Uh, but the Western United States, which again, we'll, we, we will include, you know, states like California, uh, Idaho, um, you know, if you go as far as uh, Texas and New Mexico, uh, produces about half of the in the United States, from very important dairy states in the Western United States. Um, just a couple of fun facts so that we can we can get the ball rolling. Uh, um, if you think about how much milk a single cow can produce, uh, it can produce up to eight gallons of milk a day. Uh, if it's, that's a pretty average production. If you look at that number, that's about 125 milk. So if you had cow in your backyard, it would be very difficult to maintain that um, cow um, production in your family, unless you have a very large family and they drink their milk. On average, a Holstein cow, and we all know that Holstein cow is that black and white cow that we see all the time uh, in a lot of shows, especially for food, um, produces on average, uh, I mean, it's it's on average about 1,500 pounds, fairly large animal, uh, and can consume over 100 pounds of and drinks about 50 gallons of water per hour on a daily basis. Um, one really interesting fact is that we actually produce more milk right now with 9 million cows than we produce in 1950 with 26 million cows. So what's happened in that time period is that we've gotten really good at selecting cattle for top genetics, top milk producing genetics. We've designed facilities that allow them to be comfortable and be productive. Uh, and now with a lot less animals, we can actually produce the same amount or more amount, much more milk than we did in the 90s with, with a larger quantity of, of, 
of animals. And a lot you see in the overall industry, there's a there's a trend for having bigger farms. Those bigger farms can do a better job of maintaining that production system at a level feeding high and feeds being very competitive. But there's still a lot of small dairy production in, in this United States. There's a lot of regions of the United States where pasture is available, they can have base systems and they can have a small production system. Do you have a question, Betsy? Yeah, we got, <clears throat> I'll combine them into one. How much milk and how much cheese does the average human or person eat a year? And oh, you're, well, you're, cutting, you're cutting in and out a little bit. I don't know if your mic is weird is that or better? something. We'll try it, go for it. Okay. How much milk and cheese um, does somebody eat a year? Right, that, that's a, a great question, but one that I probably not be very fairly uh, at the answer. The, the difference in cheese consumption globally is is pretty interesting. There's countries that are very high uh, consumers, and other countries that are very high um, fresh milk consumers. The United States has one of the highest uh, milk consumptions, uh, uh, and we have a high cheese consumption, but not as high as some other countries have more diversity in their cheese products. Um, I'll try to see if I can find a data point here in a little while what the average USA uh, milk and cheese consumption is, but I can't remember that off the top of my head. Uh, but we are okay. one of the top uh, consuming countries in, in the world. And, and one other question in our chat from one of our, uh, would you say that most dairy farms in Arizona are family owned and operated? You know, you always hear about factory farms or something yes. like that. So, so uh, 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 every single one of those farms is typically owned by, I mean, it, it is owned by a family, right? I mean, the size of the operation does not determine whether a farm is going to be owned by family or not, right? I mean, these families have merged uh, their operations and, and expanded and grown and have large operations in the state of Arizona, but every single one of them is family owned. I have interactions with these places on, on a regular basis. And to, to, to say that, to, to, to be uh, fully honest, most of them still work the day-to-day -day of those farms. You see the, the owners at, at the farm every day, you know, interacting with their employees and, and checking on the numbers and the production and making phone calls, you know, to, to sellers and distributors. So, yeah, it's still very much a family industry. I think in the general sense, most agriculture has to be, you, you have to grow from where it's not easy to 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 one day say oh, I want a dairy farmer and and pop up a dairy operation right it typically is is something that has to grow from from uh, you know generations of family uh, uh, bench and things like that but they they are mostly um, a family owned I think all of them in the, in the state of Arizona are yeah I think it's important that people realize that because I think they look and they see a lot of cows and they say it must be factory farm and all the negative connotations of that. And it's really somebody's family business. Right. I mean, I think, I think they grow, they understand what the, where the opportunities are and, and they, and they continue in moving into that direction. Um, most of the agricultural industries have, have, have also grown in a similar way. Right. I mean, I think it's, it's important to understand that, that a farmer needs to be profitable too. Um, nobody's farming, for, right? They're using the farming or operation to feed family and they grow their, their family well. So, uh, they move in the direction the industry allows them to be more profitable. Uh, typically, that is having a big operation that allows you to set up uh, some of the, you know, the expenses of feed and, and doing some of the other things uh, are, that are typical, uh, that are very difficult um, um, for for other uh, operations, um, and like I said before, there's still lights that you see very small, you know, family traditional family type of farm. They're not any different than what these larger farms are. Just the difference is there's more cows and maybe a little bit more boys, right? Uh, and see some smaller farms, you still have mom, dad, uh, brothers and sisters, nephews and nieces, and everybody working in their operation, obviously these larger operations typically have a labor force associated with. It's actually also very important because it, it, it brings more people into the production of the food, right? How many people are actually working in, in, in working and earning a living in that, in making that plate of that you you sit in front of uh, and enjoy in the afternoon. So yeah, it's very important to keep in mind that that these are families that are that are making a living 
out of Purdue for us. Your your mic is still doing some weird stuff. I don't know what's. Give me a second. I'm gonna try something real quick so I don't interrupt. Let me see display audio. <clears throat> yeah, because it's cutting in and out more than usual. <laughs> now we can't hear you. Can't hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Now it says. Is it cutting off? Uh, try it. Talk a little bit more. Well, I mean, you want to continue and then you can interrupt. It's bad. Okay. Um, so, yeah, one of the last things I wanted to point out that the dairy industry also moves pretty quickly, right? The fact that milk is a perishable item, something that actually has to be refrigerated and maintained uh, uh, under very strict conditions requires that our industry be very agile and very fast. So if you really think about industry, it takes about two days from milk to go from the farm to the supermarket, right? We don't want to waste time moving that. And that's part of the reason why uh, the dairy industry is in every state, right? We want to make sure that we produce food close to the people that can. And we're going to talk a little about the demographics here. Really. Um, up here actually shows that the industry um, on a per state basis, right? And the mass is, is uh, segmented in these four main regions. Again, obviously I talked to you guys a little bit about the Western part uh, and the Southwest, Northwest typically combined together of some very important dairying states like Texas, Mexico, and California. And I, like I met, but in that mix, you also have strong states like Colorado and Arizona um, uh, that are fairly uh, a big contributors. And then Washington and Oregon also uh, are important uh, producing state. Um, the Midwest is also typically been a very important milk producing region and all our fees primarily because it uh, it's a very straight to a very large part of the population of the United States. So that's why states like New York and Pennsylvania, um, Vermont, uh, historically, um, you know, have been uh, strong uh, dairy producing states. But even o Ohio and Virginia and, and states like, you know, Tennessee and Georgia um, are, are significant producers. Um, Florida is also a very important dairy state, again, because it channels that production uh, into a uh, very large population. Um, this number here, in purple, I hope you guys can see, is a really kind of small, but that actually it's what ranking of that state is um, um, nationally, right? Um, so basically, if you look at here, you see that California is ranked number one. Sorry, because my Siri is, is uh, interrupting. Um, and you see Wisconsin number two, you know, number three, you know, some of the states like New York and Pennsylvania, four and five, right? So you look at area here, we are actually number 12. Um, this fluctuates depending on what year you're looking at the statistics, but we're typically in the top 15 um, milk producing states. And, and again, that might not sound impressive as being number one, but uh, for us like Arizona and the type of environment we're in, that's actually pretty impressive that we're of uh, that uh, um, of a of a dairy state and and here I'm just going to give you some comparison so you guys have an idea of why our industry is important and how it differs from some other uh, regions. So again, I'm going to compare here with the Wisconsin, which is number two state. And one of the things that's really important is this number here represents how many animals we have milking cattle. Right, this is a uh, per hundred thousand. So so uh, per a thousand means that this one hundred three thousand ahead of cattle compared to Wisconsin that has 1.2, 1 1.3 million um, uh, animals, right? But uh, what's really fascinating is the things that, that Arizona does extremely well. So things, we are actually one of the top um, um, average herd size state uh, uh, states in the United States. That means that our dairy operations tend to be larger, right? Again, we talked a little bit about why it's important to be big in some of these environments. And our environment is really important because a lot of grain is being produced in the Midwest and you need to have some buying power to be able to bring in these commodities at a price that is, that is competitive. The other thing that's really impressive is that we are actually number four in average production, okay? Let me compare that to Wisconsin. 
Okay, Wisconsin, the great dairy state, actually number 15 in milk production. Okay, uh, typically the states that are above us would be states like Michigan, um, you know, New York State sometimes has a very high production. But it's impressive for me to consider that, that Arizona, when we actually think about this very harsh environment, very high temperatures, that we're actually able to be number four in milk production. Uh, in, in the United States. And I think we're going to talk a little bit uh, about those, those, uh, uh, those reasons why we can actually do that um, in, in Arizona. Let's, let's move along here. Um, the other thing that's really important to understand is, again, like I said before, I think um, a lot of product tends to gather around population, large populations. And Phoenix is actually a really large population. And if you look at um, counties that have higher concentration of dairy, dairy operations, actually Maricopa and County both rank in the top top 15 most concentrated dairy uh, counties in the United States. And again, in, in this case, they're, they may even be the most concentrated counties in the world, right? I mean, the way our production is set up, um, you know, Maricopa is, is only, I think, one of the few um, non-California County actually um, uh, ranks in the top 10, and Pinnell also very, very high up there. And the reason for this is because we're, we need to be close to that major metropolis, which is Phoenix, and that allows them to actually make milk. The other reason why those are created there is also because the milk plants are there. And cost and effect, the milk plants are there because the dairies are there, or the dairies are there because the milk is there. But we have two very large milk plants in uh, Phoenix area. And that's why the dairy operations seem to be concentrated around there. Uh, one thing you probably have noticed is that dairy operations seem to move at the outskirts of the population. So as the cities grow, these operations tend to move uh, further, further away. Obviously, you know, the, the general uh, doesn't always understand that, that, you know, the milk needs to be close to them. And, and so there's a little bit of encroachment there and we have to do that as an industry. So like I said before, the reason why those counties are so important is, is primarily to meet the market demand in, in that area. And Betsy, if I have questions, let me know, because I just see the, the, the way my computer's set up right now. Um, okay, well, we've got, we've got some questions that can wait till we get to a more appropriate place. So you go for it. Okay. And I told you guys about the Western region being about 50% of the state. Um, Southwest region is also very uh, important. Um, obviously, the largest contributors there are California, Mexico, and Texas. We're, we're a very strong uh, industry in, in that region. Nevada is not a very um, active um, state, and, and they definitely, from California and Arizona, having very strong industry. Um, the other thing I, I think it's important to, to understand is um, how the United States ranks uh, in overall milk production. And I think um, the only a region that's more important than the United States is actually the European Union. And I think like the example I gave about, um, you know, uh, vegetables and fruits all being combined to be uh, one industry, um, that's kind of how this is set up, right? The European Union is actually many countries uh, and they in combination are actually a very large um, combination of countries, but the United States is by far the most um, significant producer of milk in the world by, by a long shot. Uh, the only country that um, actually uh, will have some uh, production, um, at least as the number of is India, uh, where they actually have, you know, maybe five times the number of cows in the United States, but their production is very low. These are very small operations uh, and typically are, are um, you know, uh, family uh, cows, one cow, two cow, three cow farms type of operations. They're not uh, producing at the high level. China is also a very important global milk player. Uh, they continuously uh, grow. Again, just to, for a little bit of perspective, in China, maybe 20, 20 years ago, um, milk products were not very common in their diet. And in the last you know decades, we start seeing a lot of of uh, diet, uh, a lot of influences right now. So they're eating pizza and they're eating other of uh, uh, diet sources that actually include uh, dairy products. And that has actually bumped uh, their consumption significantly. And they're also very large 
producer or also a very large buyer of, of their products. Um, New Zealand is a really interesting example where there's more cattle than 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 human use more milk, but they are very strategically um, seeing um, byproducts of the dairy industry, so whey proteins and some of the extracts of that of that, and they've they've found that a pretty good niche market for them. So they produce more milk than they they consume in the country. Uh, the United States are very peculiar because we produce for it, and we also buy dairy-based products. Primarily, we buy these proteins, whey proteins that are utilized to stabilize foods like that. Uh, but And we also export to other markets, mostly pot milk to China and some places in America. Okay, you're getting, you're breaking up Morse now. Well, I don't, I don't have a clue what that could be because I changed microphones. I mean, give me one more shot. <sighs> you, you sound good now, but you just were doing a little alien stuff. Maybe it's because you're going at a buck ninety. <laughs> slow know. down. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to slow down a little bit. Okay. I went too far. Um, like I said before, uh, we're both importers and exporters of milk products. But here's a really good graphic that shows our primary buy of dairy products from the United States is Mexico um, as number three. Um, obviously, those are neighboring countries, so that makes it facilitates the export of multiple items. So they do actually consume some of our uh, milk-based products, right? Uh, China, being a faraway country, primarily consumes some of the powder milk. Same with South Korea, Japan, and, and some of the Asian countries. Uh, and like I said before, we buy a lot of whey-based proteins from New Zealand. They've specialized in that market and it's it's utilized food st stabilization and in other industries um most of us have been exposed to some level to what a dairy cow is and again the iconic dairy cow image is this holstein cow again and you see it where you see it in in chick-fil-a commercials and you see it uh left and right uh, but there's a lot of dairy breeds that are are utilized in the United States. Um, it's the second popular breed. Uh, it's a little smaller. Uh, it also produces more, uh, uh, has a lot more milk fat. So milk that is utilized in industries like the butter uh, industries or some of the cheeses. So in markets where that is produced, a lot of Jersey it can be uh, very, um, very um, proficient in that production system. Arizona has some Jersey operations, uh, but the vast majority of the cows in the state are the large Holstein um, cattle. Um, our Shires, Brown Swiss, Wernseys, Milk and Shore, you still see some of them uh, in some parts of the United States, but the vast majority of the production is, is concentrated in the Holstein breed uh, for a lot of reasons, but mostly because they're, they're the highest producing. They have the highest uh, production of, of any of those breeds. Um, the composition of what a good deal looks like is, is pretty pretty diverse. Um, you know, we we look at states that are very similar to to when you go and and do judging of of cattle in general. Uh, obviously, for us, some of the things that are very important uh, in in a dairy cow are related to its capacity, ability to actually produce milk. So we we give the most uh, uh, importance to the udder. Again, in a in a Dairy cow scorecard, about 40% of the, the value is given to the udder. Um, you know, second by their called dairy character. So it's a frame, this type of, of, of a structure that is um, associated with producing dairy cow. Um, you know, frame, you know, the size is obviously there is some of that uh, related to reproduction, the capacity of the body, and also the feet and the legs. So one thing to note is that. Most people don't understand, but you know, cows need to from the parlor and be there, uh, being um, on a daily basis, two to three times a day. So they need to have some good legs to be able to to move through through the system. Uh, the production for dairy are, are are pretty diverse. Um, none is better than the other. It depends on on what your goals are, the type of operation you want to be working in, or living in the world, and what you have available. Um, there are some grazing operations where animals are strictly eating pastures from the 
from the field. Um, again, that's not very common. It's not common in, in Arizona at all because we don't have those lush pastures uh, um, growing naturally. They would be uh, have irrigated. Um, most of the cattle in, in Arizona are on what we call a TMR base, which are total mixed ration, which is essentially we make a salad for them. We make a mixture for them and we feed it to them, you know, a couple times a day to make sure they have fresh feed. Um, they, these uh, TMR base can be either free stall or dry lots. Most of the Arizona are dry lots. We take advantage of the sun, the sun intensity to recycle some of those uh, uh, pens where the animals are are being held and, and, and the sun and the environment do a very good job of, of um, um, recycling that for us so we can reuse. Cooking systems are also very diverse. Um, there's a lot of uh, dairy operations in Arizona that have a carousel system. And again, it's the carousel, it's exactly what it sounds like. The cows go in from one side, they get into these little stalls and this thing is actually rotating. And once they start rotating here, they do the first prep. Then they'll attach the system, they'll be milked all the way through, and then as they're getting to the end, they'll do the post clean and the, uh, uh, the animals back up from that system and then walk away. Cows don't want to go to get milk. You know, milk production actually costs us from that udder, and they're very eager to go and get milk. Uh, we have a lot of uh, herring bones and parallel parlors, typically very large dairy operations to have these types of parlors because it's, it's often difficult to get a carousel uh, of, the, of the right size. Um, they're usually milked, like I said, two to three times a day. Uh, one other innovation in the dairy industry parlors are the robotic milkers. Um, this is exactly what it sounds like. It comes in there by their own will. Um, there is a sensor that when they come in, will take an image of their udder. The milking cups in there would get milk. And then she, as soon as she's finished, uh, she gets out and another cow goes in there. It's not very common in Arizona. Larger operations struggle with these types of systems because they're, they're very expensive and mechanically uh, um, uh, complex. Uh, but I see, I see a lot of that uh, in the future in, in a lot of operations. Um, I'm going to briefly go through what I call the life cycle part here. Um, the idea so that you guys get some basic understanding. Uh, of the industry. But again, one thing that's actually really important for us to understand is that the dairy industry is dependent on reproduction of that cow to be able to produce milk, right? If, unless the mom has a baby, um, she's not going to produce milk. So we have an industry that is constantly renewing animals because we have to breed into that industry. So mom will have a calf. And if that calf is a male or a female, decisions will be made on what that calf is going to end up on. Uh, a being in that production system, right? If they're males are typically gone into, you know, either uh, a general type of feedlot so that they can uh, gain weight and then be harvested for, for meat. Uh, if they're female, they go into the replacement um, herd. We actually have some sophisticated tools in our industry that we can actually use uh, semen that sex, meaning that we can actually increase the chances of getting a female uh, and that does make sure that we have through that. Them. So um, it has actually evolved a lot. When the animals are born, um, what the dairy will do, is they actually will grab colostrum from the best moms. So they'll test that colostrum and get the best colostrum and they'll pull that together and then I give it to all the cats. All can get the best colostrum and the best start in their in their life cycle. So, and we, we keep, um, Cabs in, in many different types of systems. Um, you know, these hutches are very popular, especially these in the desert, because you can move them uh, and, and, you know, let the ground uh, be exposed to the environment. Uh, these plastic hutches also are uh, common. We start seeing a lot more group uh, houses so where there's multiple animals in, in one of those uh, uh, pens, small pens. Um, and that seems to be, um, you know, one area where we do research to understand if that's beneficial to that. But like I said before, we, we're dependent on that production cycle. Uh, we would like these to have, you know, up to five or six lactations. But uh, in general terms, because we have replacements into the system, if a cow is not doing well or she has some health issues, there's always a replacement in that in that system. Go in there and take her place and make that that production that the planet is expecting. Um, so cows are expected to calve once a year. 
lactation on average lasts about 305 days. Uh, and there's about a two month uh, dry period. So where she can rest and recover, she can actually compensate some of the um, some of the weight that she's lost through through lactation. Um, lactation is is a is a very complex um, you know physical process in a cow. Again, an animal is going from not producing any milk to all of a sudden producing very high qualities of milk. So that's very complex uh, system. Uh, we split lactation in some parts. The first is the lactation, which is um, you know the, those first a hundred days, ninety a hundred days. Um, where the animal is producing the most amount of milk, you know, she reaches peak production about 60 days. Um, and then milk lactation, there's slowly a decline in milk production. Egg lactation, that's dwindling, and that's when we know she's ready um, to be dried off and, and, and resume that rest period and finalize the birth of that offspring. This is a lactation curve. Again, I'm not uh, here to quiz you or anything, but again, I just show you this line right here bottom she's not producing any milk and then all of a sudden boom she produces really large quantities of milk uh gets to peak about sea and then kind of doing off so she tries to eat a lot of food eat that but there's a period here we call negative energy and that basically means she can't eat enough support that milk production so she's mobile tissues and that means she's, she's actually getting a little skinnier just mobilizing some of that fat so that she can actually provide energy to gain that milk production. And I think that's an extremely fascinating uh, process for, for these cattle. They're making an incredible sacrifice uh, to, to actually produce milk for what, in all intents and purposes, their offspring, right? They do not know that that milk is, is going to us in terms. They're producing as much and be somebody suffer from there, right? Uh, production of feeding, uh, we talked a little bit about racing and TMR, and there's also the organic industry, again, that's the same as any other industry uh, in this system. It's just that they have some restrictions about what can be fed and cannot be fed. Uh, most organic milk production is, is what we call UHT, which means that it's been ultra high temperature pasteurization. And that's really why organic milk has a longer shelf life in the, in the market. It has nothing to do with the quality of the milk. Um, if you took regular UHT, it would have the same uh, life. But again, there's a component of the market that drink organic milk, and and that's also a viable industry in there. Um, I'm I'm near. I just wanted to go through two more slides about um, operation types, uh, and I have my slide where I like to show them the cooling systems. So just again. Uh, Cattle leave, uh, cows live in very, uh, in all types of different uh, environments. Again, kind of like humans, apartments and houses and farms. And, you know, some are in freestall barns. Freestall barns are somewhat a popular uh, in the United States, popular system. These cattle are, they have a little stall where they sit and there's usually sand or, or water beds or whatever. So they're comfortable in there. On Arizona, we, we tend to, we call dry lots because again, we take advantage of that. Um, so there's there's roofing here so that they can protect from the heat. But typically we have these type of systems that we call Saudi barns. So they're in here for feed. They can go out to the, in the outside to stretch their legs or do whatever they want, but they're normal in this environment. And in this environment, we spend a lot of time and effort cooling them. Um, the reason why Arizona production is so high is because we don't have to predict what the weather is going to be in Arizona. We make it in these operations to cool them because we want to be cool most of the year. A lot of other states struggle with that because they have a hard making the investment for maybe only a month worth of heat or two weeks or three weeks. In Arizona, we know we're going to have the main year uh, on elevated temperatures. So the facilities are, are actually designed with these cooling systems at the bottom, you can see it's almost like uh, air conditioning, right? I mean, it's a, the equivalent of some type of swamp cooler. Uh, and typically these animals are, I anticipated the joke. So typically these guys are actually in, in, in temperatures that are much lower than what the environmental temperature is. Uh, in cases, they're kept in the high 60s, so 68, 69, 67, 65s, even if it's 115, 120 outside. It allows our cows to be as comfortable as this gentleman here, uh, this lady right here swimming in, in, 
in the in the pool. Um, so uh, again, our system allows us to to take advantage of the fact that Arizona has a very good way and build our facilities to to maximize production in that system. And that's the reason why Arizona dairy industry is so large and so competitive, even though we live in a climate that is um, somewhat difficult um, um, for most production. And I think that's my last slide, Betsy. So we had a couple questions, <clears throat> one of them kind of with the processing and talking about, let's scroll back to it. Um, why is some milk sold refrigerated, <clears throat> some sold on store shelves without refrigeration, and is the shelf stuff safe? Okay, so yeah, so uh, UH, so I briefly mentioned UHT, the you know, ultra high temperature uh, pasteurization. UHT actually allows that when you tetra pack them in those little boxes, um, the milk is actually stable without being refrigerated because there's no oxygen in the box. As soon as you open that box, you have to refrigerate it, and that's when it, it, it established normal shelf life. So, yes, that milk that is being sold in the shelf that is non-refrigerated is just viable as other milk. Uh, it tastes different. So UHT processing actually um, uh, is some of the flavor. It caramelizes some of the sugars. So uh, the time you drink milk, it, it may taste different enough to notice, right? Uh, but it's it's fairly, I mean, most of the world drinks UHT milk. Uh, they don't have refrigerating as a common as common as it is in the United States. So again, I grew up in the Caribbean. Most of our milk is UHT. Uh, it's it's in the it's in the pantry. Uh, so when you open it, you chill it when you're gonna drink it, and then and then it's in the in the refrigerator for for whatever number of days uh, before it, it actually uh, will go bad. In general terms, that's the same thing I said with organic milk. Organic is normally because it has to stay in the shelf longer. The smaller percentage of the population that actually consume organic milk, they can't have that turnover of milk. So they try to UHT it so that it actually lasts longer in the supermarket and it's stable. But yeah, it's perfectly stable. Uh, it's just a taste a little, it's a little while to get used to that uh, different taste. Okay, so we had another question. <coughs> Excuse me. Why does almost almost all milk products say RSB RBST free? Is RBST not good for you? What about the other hormones and antibiotics in milk? So that's, that's a really yeah, <laughs> really great question. It's a really complex question, and it probably would take about an hour for us to go into the specific details. But um, about after World War II, there was a major shortage of food in the United States. There was, a, uh, there was an extensive uh, push by agencies in the government, especially USDA, to actually increase agriculture uh, production, right? To actually provide food for a growing population. And one of the things that came off of that was that um, some scientists developed a way to synthesize this uh, BST hormone. Um, so that they can maintain milk production for periods of time. So cows, remember that milk curve that I showed you uh, on BST actually maintain that peak longer periods and actually um, plateau later on. Um, that allowed for significant increases in milk production at a time milk was, was a necessary staple. Um, there's been a ton of uh, on, on that um, um, Hormone is is actually uh, diff any different than the naturally produced in the animal, and it doesn't it doesn't seem to be. Uh, and it it has actually been uh, proven to be safe. I mean, you know, we drank that milk for a very long time. But what happens is consumers typically have a a large impact on industry choices, and consumers did not like the concept of added hormones. The milk should say no added RBST because all milk has BST, or it should say no RBT, which is the recombinant, which is the synthetic one made. Um, again, I think the, I can I can give you my opinion whether that is safe. My family drank BST milk for, for a very long time. Um, but, um, that's a consumer choice. And we have had to go uh, in the direction of not utilizing the, the, the BST. Um, as other hormones, 
uh, present. Uh, milk, milk is actually a secretion of the mammary gland, so it's actually going to have components of, of what that animal is, is, is processing. There no additional hormones. There's no uh, um, uh, contaminants in that milk. The plant is very robust and very serious about when they buy milk, they test everything, and it has to be within the images that are allowed uh, for what should be. Uh, and if anything gets out of whack on that range, that will not get accepted and will not get into the plant. So, um, you know, I think milk milk is a, is a very important um, nutrient uh, for our population. I think you know, the biggest advertisement I can give you about milk consumption is that my family, everybody in my family, we go through a gallon of milk a day. We drink whole whole fat milk. We like that taste. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 a very well regulated industry, and there's a lot of checks and balances in the system to show that you're getting the top uh, quality product without any contaminants. Uh, in yeah, I don't I don't think people realize just how tested and how strict everything is and that there's not just willy nilly throwing stuff at the cow or in the <laughs> in the feed or in the milk. But yeah, I mean, I think I think, again, the, the industry is extremely robust about how they, um, you know, screen the system because they know that that's that's has a negative impact on the industry as a whole. Right. Um, yeah, they test they at them at the dairy when they they get the mill, pick it up and they test again when the milk gets to the plant before it can even enter the plant. And if it doesn't meet the standards, it is not allowed to go into the plant. Yeah. Hey, we got one last question for you. And then we got a quick couple minutes with uh, Ashley Jeffers sample for um, 4-H and dairy projects in Arizona. What happens to a dairy cow after it, after it is no longer able to produce milk? Well, part of what I what I mentioned that of the dual purpose of that of our industry, um, dairy cows in general that are productive cycle will go to some type of feedlot environment where they would, um, you know, try to put as much weight as they can, and then they'll be harvested for for meat consumption. I think if you really think about a lot of the uh, beef products that we consume, a big percentage of the what we consume in meat is actually ground beef, and large part of that beef actually is coming from from dairy operations right so so that um has a productive in production of milk but after that that cow will go into a feed type of environment will gain additional weight and then will will be um will be harvested for production but not only that ground beef it's all those products that you about that we we generate from from that animal when it's when it's harvested. So it does um, it does give a lot of of products to 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 the to the farmers when it's when this productive cycle is is over. That's excellent. Well, we have Ty Lee is very excited because he's going to show Dairy 4-H. So let's go ahead and let Ashley get her slides up, and while she's doing that, we will. Thank Duarte so much for attending and presenting guys, really cool stuff. Thank you guys. It's fun to you guys and hopefully see you um, at, at a dairy farm in the near future. <laughs> Drink more milk. Drink a lot of milk. <laughs> Thanks, Duarte. Perfect. So I'll be really quick today, but just to remind you of some of the opportunities that Arizona 4-H offers for those of you interested in the dairy product. Project. And it's so great to see that one of you um, on here tonight will be showing dairy. That's so fun and really exciting. Um, so, and also don't forget to fill out the evaluation. The link is in there. That's really important for us to know kind of what some takeaways were for you. So, like I said, really quickly. So Duarte talked a lot about dairy cattle, and that is our biggest dairy project in Arizona. But we also, in terms of 4-H, but we also offer dairy goat projects as well. So these are the two project areas that you can get involved in when it comes to dairy. Is there anyone else other than Tylee that shows dairy? If there is, just go ahead and throw it in there. Um, so these are the two areas that we offer in terms of dairy projects. 
Now, some opportunities aside from just our county projects, we do have a 4-H dairy judging contest that is at the World Dairy Expo. Also, there is um, a 4-H dairy judging contest at the Junior Dairy Expo as well. So if you're interested and we have enough youth members in Arizona who are interested in dairy judging, that is an opportunity for us to go to a national contest. Currently, we do not have a state contest, but I'm sure if we had enough interest, we'd be able to put one together. And then just a fun plug, and this doesn't just fall for... Um, this doesn't just fall for the dairy youth members, but any youth member that you know that is a senior in high school, um, they can apply to the Arizona Dairy Council, Arizona Milk Producers now, to their scholarship. So um, there's three college scholarships with up to $12,000 in funds, and they do a really, really neat um, milk mustache photo contest. So as you can see, here are some three examples of the past some of the past applicants. So it's a really fun way to get creative. And especially if you show dairy, I think that it would be a lot of fun for you to put your project animal, you know, to use in another aspect. So make sure to apply um, to this Arizona Milk Producers Scholarship. It's a great opportunity. And I think that having um, your dairy cow in your photo um, would be lots of fun and might even give you a little bit of an edge. Um, another thing that's uh, not listed on here, but that I wanted to talk um, talk about in regards to some of our project areas um, that deal with dairy. If any of you do any um, like milk production as a side business or anything in terms of your byproducts with your um, dairy cow or dairy goat, we are going to be starting a entrepreneurship, kind of like a what we're going to call a teen tank. It's like a youth version of Shark Tank. And so that's going to be a statewide contest for youth members to show off their business skills and any byproducts or any um, products that they're making from their 4-H projects. So keep that in mind. Details about that are still going to be coming out in later this year. But if you do anything with your dairy products or your byproducts of your dairy animals, it would be a great way to show off some of your skills and your products. And then the last thing I have in regards to um, our 4 H content tonight is, please remember that this goes into your record book as a state activity. You know, you're gaining a lot of great information and you're benefiting from it. And so we don't wanna to forget to put that in to your record book so that you can remember that you attended this. You can get points um, when you turn in your record book for any of our state um, programs that require it. And aside from that, are there any 4-H related questions? Oh, I think you're muted, Betsy. I am. That's awesome. We're gonna have some competitors in that milk mustache, I think, from the look yeah. in the chat. It's super fun. So I think that it's a great, great way to win some money. <laughs> and and you know something cool that you guys might not realize, Duarte was actually really nice to come talk to us because he just got done with his research project for the day, <clears throat> or maybe oh. not done all the way, with heat stress on cattle. Ashley Wright, do you have you have a little bit more knowledge on what he's doing just briefly, right? And make you show up and talk. <laughs> not um not a hundred percent, but I know he so he has some cows and he's looking to see if there's things that they can supplemental feed the, these cows that will help them do a lot better in our Arizona heat. Um, we all know how hot it is, how hot it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so if we can find some sort of a feed supplement that will help these cattle not feel so hot, that can help them to perform better because when they're not hot, they're a lot more comfortable um, and they're not heat stressed. They're going to produce more milk. They're going to eat better um, and they're just going to feel better. So that's what he's working on with those cattle. Yeah, we struggled with last year with the veal calves and Parker from the heat. I bet you did. Holy moly. It gets pretty hot. It, it makes Tucson look like air conditioning sometimes so compared to Parker area and Yuma. <laughs> so, but anyway, any other questions or comments for us? Duarte had to go back and finish up his research duties, but 
Anything else? Because that's what we have tonight. Our next next one and our last AZ Ag at home, at least for now, is when is that? <laughs> I looked and I forget. August. It's already it's on the website, and it's ranch dogs, ranch dogs. So early August, I think, right? August fifth. Thank you, August fifth. And so. Make sure you come in and join. It'll be ranch dogs, a little bit of fun, and kind of finishing up an excellent seminar webinar series. So thanks so much for coming. Make sure you fill out that um, survey. Ashley Wright put that in the chat. And thank you, Ashley Jeff for Sample, for a great presentation. Or Mangus, <laughs> you're still Ashley Jeff for Sample to me. And yeah, now that you're works. me. <laughs> that works. <laughs> okay. Well